Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me and see me clearly. As as Sivan was mentioning, my name is Mamadur Patmik. I'm an assistant professor in civil engineering at UBC's Okanagan campus, which is in Canada. And my research, I am also the director of the UBC's Integrated Transportation Research Lab. And my research interest re mainly revolves around travel demand forecasting. And one of the models that I build is an agent-based integrated urban model within which I try to simulate people's transportation choices and residential location choices, data ownership and others so that we can use the model to test out the impact of different transit and land use related policies and travel management plans and strategies. And today, what I'm going to present is using a Bayesian network modeling technique to develop a population synthesis. And this is a critical component of population synthesis for an agent-based model. Without further ado, maybe I will start my presentation. And if anyone has any question, please do let me know anytime during the presentation. In terms of the outline, I have a pretty standard outline today. So we'll start with the background. Mainly I will discuss why we are doing population synthesis, what is population synthesis, and how we are using Bayesian network to do it, or why, as well as why we are using Bayesian network to do it. Then I will present the proposed population synthesis procedure, modeling frameworks to you. After that, I will discuss about the study area and the data that we are using to build a, a network and generate the synthetic population. Then I will discuss the results. In the results, I, I will briefly discuss the Bayesian structure that we built using the data. And I will spend a lot of time in discussing the validation of the results, which is very important when we try to implement these models to forecast the travel demand and tries to assist cities and transit agencies to develop different plans and policies. And finally, I will conclude with a summary and some future direction. Okay. So, so this uh, population synthesis procedure that we are developing is a uh, generates an input for an agent-based integrated urban model. The model that I am building in my lab is known as Stellar. So the full form is simulator for transportation, land use, energy, and land use for regional systems. The scope of the model is pretty wide. It's a large scale model that deals with transportation and related decisions that that is made by individuals in, in a city, as well as it can also be applicable for a region, which involves a might include many cities. As you can see or understand the range or the scope of the model, the number of agents can be ranging from hundreds of thousands to millions. Now, in this model, the agents are households and individuals. Now, the way the agents works in the model is as is they make different decisions in an autonomous way. However, these decisions are based on their social demographic and spatial attributes. So for example, their age, gender, income, as well as where they live, where they work. Uh, because the fundamental concept for building this large scale model is transportation decision depends on many other decisions, such as our decision of what mode to choose, like whether to use a transit or car, depends on where we live, where we work, whether we own a vehicle or not. As agents makes all these decisions, we need to run this model. We need detailed information about each agent. And those detailed information refers to their social demographic and their spatial attributes. Now, which means to initiate this simulation model, we need to know every individual and household in a city or in a region and their social demographic and spatial context. Now, such data is not readily available, particularly such disaggregate level data is not readily available. Census has that data. However, that's not access. We can do survey to collect the data from the population. However, that would be extremely costly. There are some existing survey like travel survey that many of the cities around the world does. However, that data represents a small proportion of the population, not the entire population. So the alternative is to generate a synthetic population. And to do that, we use the strengths 
and address the limitation of the existing data and then generate the synthetic population. So basically what a synthetic population synthesis is, it's a procedure where we use the existing data to generate a synthetic data that represents two large as broadly two aspects of their actual population. One is the demographic attributes such as age, gender, income, dwelling type, those. And second is a spatial attribute, for example, where they live, where they work. Now, if you take a look into, turn on my laser pointer. Okay. So what we typically do is, or the data that is available, as I mentioned, we use the existing data. Typically, there is this control total or marginal total data that is available that comes from the census. What census publishes is sociodemographic attributes, but at a very aggregate level. So for example, if you see this, if this is a city, they divide the city into many zones. And then for each zone, as you can see in the table, we have the sociodemographic information at an aggregate level. So we have since what census data provides us is a spatial attribute, like where people are living and what is their characteristics that, but at an aggregate level, not at a disaggregate level that we need to do to run as a human based model. That second set of data that is available is a disaggregate microscope. This can be a travel survey or even census publishes a proportion of the data as a micro data file, which is known as public use micro data file, found data. And this data, as you can see in this short table, that we have detailed information about of the sample that they published. For example, each household, their household level attribute like car availability, for example, if it's a travel survey, then dwelling type, household income, as well as the number of people that lives in their household, we have specific information about theirs as well. For example, individual level information, for example, work status, age, gender, and so on. However, the limitation of this data is we have no idea where these people live. So we have detailed demographic information, but no spatial information, this microsample. So the typical case, what we do is, and even that is exactly what we are going to do in this research, or we did in this research is we use this microsample and we expanded the sample. So now we have a set of data that has a number of, we have a set of large set of data where we know each detailed information about each individual and household in the data. However, we don't know their spatial context. After expanding the data, what we do is we match with the control total and allocate that data into these different dissemination areas or census track based on the need of the research. And then we know that, okay, this is where these folks live. Now, as you can imagine, one of the critical pieces here is expanding the data from the micro sample to a larger sample. The better we can represent the actual population in the expanded data, the better the synthetic population would be and the better the agent model would at the end of the great predict and the policies that we take will be less biased. So there is a huge implication the quality of the population synthesis has in overall forecasting accuracy. Now, and this is expanding the data is a complex procedure, to be honest, because there are two broadly two levels of data that is available. One is the household level data, for example, dwelling type, household income, a number of people in the household and so on. Another is within the household, there are many people. So those people have occupation, for example, age, gender, income, and so on. Now, as we expand that data, we need to retain this interdependency among the household and individual level attributes, right? The better we can address the interdependency in the expanded data, the better the population, synthetic population will represent the actual population. And this is where Bayesian network comes into the play because the BN Pfizer network, in short, BN is an efficient model to represent or reproduce the underlying structure of the population. And that's why we are actually utilizing BN for this case. So in this research, what we have done is we have adopted a Bayesian network technique to generate a population synthesis. One of the unique pieces that we did is while we generated this, we accommodated heterogeneity. 
By that, what I mean is we don't have one Bayesian network or one Bayesian structure that represents the whole population. Rather, our assumption is there could be many different number of Bayesian network that might represent a certain group of the population. For example, the Bayesian network representing the interdependency of the variables for a single person household could be different than households where there is, who has children. So we have tried to accommodate that heterogeneity while we built the Bayesian network structure. And then from the structure, we built the population pool and generated a 100% synthetic population. And we evaluated how closely it matches the actual population. I'm going to spend a lot of time to show you how we use different metrics to validate the population synthesis. So now in the proposed framework, what we have is it's a two-stage process that we have adopted, very similar to what other population synthesis technique used. However, our, in our case, the method is the significantly different. So in the first stage, which represents this upper portion of the illustration, what we did is we generated a population pool. So we used the pump microsample. From the pump microsample, we, dis we, we, created, we created different segments based on the household type. I will introduce later on what these household types are. And then for each household type, we developed a Bayesian network structure. And after building a Bayesian network structure, based on the conditional probability that we got in the structure, we, we developed a population pool using a forward sampling technique. So in the population put, as you can see from a certain percentage of the population, we have expanded that to the full size of the population. But in this stage, we know many people, the full size and their demographic distribution. However, we have no idea where these people actually live. And that is where the second stage comes into the play, where we are generating the synthetic population in more specifically allocating this population pool into different dissemination area using a fitting based technique, which is in our case, a generalized breaking technique. Breaking technique is what we used. And that's what we did. So these are the two stages that we followed to develop a hundred percent synthetic population. The study area for our study is at the central Okanagan region of British Columbia, Canada. So central Okanagan is southern, is in the southern part of British Columbia and British Columbia is in the west coast. Of Canada. And this region includes five cities, uh, Kelowna, West Kelowna, Lake Country, Vernon, and Pitchhead. As you can see, Kelowna is, is the economic hub and the majority of the population in this region lives and work in this area. Now, the special unit of analysis for us is a dissemination area, which is which comes from census. So what census did, they, they uh, divided this whole region into 293 dissemination areas and each dissemination area has around on an average of 400 to 500 individuals. In terms of the data, as I already mentioned, we are using two sets of data. The first set of data is the aggregate marginal total, which is the 2016 Canadian census. And that information is available at the dissemination area level. In this area, based on the 2016 census, around 218,500 individuals lives in around 91,600 households. Now, a certain percentage of that data is available in terms of microsample. As you can see, also got from the 2016 Canadian census and it's known as the pump data. Out of this 200,000 population, we have around, we have the detailed data of around 21,000 individuals living in 9,000 households. However, and I will repeat, we don't, we have detailed information of this, this micro sample, but we don't know that spatial. So the very, so in the population synthesis, the variables that we are synthesizing, there is a list of them. There, we can categorize them into two broad classes. The first one is the individual level attributes. So there are seven individual level attributes we are synthesizing. So gender, age, marital status, education, employment status, personal income, and occupation. And the second category is the household level attributes. There are a total of six types of variables we are synthesizing, which are household size, household income, tenure, built here of the dwelling, number of rooms in the dwelling, and the dwelling type. As you can see, each variable or attribute has many categories, and which is also ranges a lot. For example, gender, there are two categories, whereas age, we have 13 categories. And we the, one of the reasons for 
synthesizing these attributes is these are the attributes that is available both in the pump and in the census marginal total data. And that is important because if we don't have any of these variables in one of the data, it becomes extremely challenging to synthesize it. Now, so the first stage of what we did is we used the pump data to develop these PN structures. Now, as I mentioned already, we are trying to capture heterogeneity among different, and we are at, at capturing heterogeneity based on different household types because our assumption is different household types, the variable might have a different relationship. So we have, we have considered five types of households, which are single member, couple without children, couple with children, lone parent with children, and others. And we built Bayesian network stru Bayesian structure for each of these type of households. The way we built it is we started with no relationship and then we added, de deleted, and modified relationship based on two, just one, we adopted a scoring approach. And second, we also considered expert opinion. For example, in an expert opinion, if you see, in none of these Bayesian network structure, we have a relationship between an individual's age and gender, which is expected because age, age is less likely to be affected by gender or vice versa. And the scoring comes into play is the highest the score we get, we retain that after we retain that structure. Now, based on we estimated or built the structure for all five household types, for example, I'm showing you three of them and two of broad observations we can have from these structures. The first one is we, we have seen some common relationship among these structures. So for example, in all the base structure, we will see Age is the parent node and marriage, education, and occupation is our child nodes, which makes sense because these are dependent on the person's age. So that's one common example of a common relationship that we observe. We also observed het significant heterogeneity in the relationship across different household types, and which was one of the motivation for us to build these different Bayesian network structures for different household types. And I will give you one example or one specific observation, which is, for example, if we take a look into household, couple household with children, household size is the parent node and number of rooms in the dwelling, dwelling type are child nodes, which is, which actually makes sense because the larger the household would be, the, the greater the rooms that people might require. And that might also dictate the type of dwelling they might get, like if it's a single detached or a row house or apartment and so on. However, household size was not found to be, however, such relationship was not found to be for evident for other type of households where the number of household size is fixed. For example, single person household, the household size is one. A couple household without children, the household size is two. So those, so that's the significant heterogeneity that we have observed in the BN structure. So. Once we built these BN structures, what we for each of these five types of household, then what we did is the conditional probability that we estimate we found from here. Based on that, we used a forest sampling technique to expand the data to create a million population living in 400,000 households. And the process that we use for to do that is we maintain the same conditional probability that we got from this Bayesian network structures. And now I will show you spend rest of my presentation to show you how well we did or how what is the fitting of this synthetic population compared to the existing population. I hope I'm doing well in terms of time, I believe I am. Okay. So now, now the first thing that I'm showing you is the synthetic population pool. So we, ha we have just expanded the data and uh, the next few slides, I will show you how this data matches the pound for data. So the here, different graphs shows different household level attributes. So we synthesize six types of attributes, dwelling type, household size, household income, tenure type, period of construction, and number of rooms in the dwelling. And each, if we take for an example, dwelling type, the X axis, the one, two, three, this represents the different categories that are within dwelling type. There are three categories. So single test is one, apartment is two, and other types are three. And Y axis represents the proportion of the households that falls under these different categories. What we can see is the synthetic population very well 
matches the, the actual pound data. And this observation is can be extended for all household types. And, and what one of the observations that I would like to share with you is that we see in the household income. If you take a look, this has a large number of categories. And when there comes a large number of categories, we have seen a slightly more error than if there is a less number of categories within the variable. However, the error is within minus one plus one percent for majority of the categories. In this slide, we are sh I'm showing you the validation for individual level as attributes. And we have synthesized seven types of so gender, age, marital status, education, employment, personal income, and occupation. And again, the Y, X and Y axis represents very, has very similar meaning here. And as you can see, again, for majority of the cases, our, our, our synthetic pool represents actual population within a plus minus 1% range of error. However, if you see age, there are 13 categories and the error is larger than, for example, gender, which had only two categories. After validating, sure, validating for individual and household level attributes separately. Now I will show you joint distribution for household level attributes. So here, what we did is, for example, the first graph, what you can see here is we have, I'm showing you the joint distribution of dwelling type and household size. The x-axis represent the pump data, the y-axis represent the synthetic pool. And if you take a look into the plot, as well as the R squared, we are seeing a very close a value very close to one. And this is evident in all the other types of joint distribution that we have generated. So from a joint, not only from an individual distribution, from a joint distribution perspective, we are also doing reasonably well, in fact, very well to represent the data. So now after checking the joint distribution at the household level, we were also interested to check how much we are representing the actual really actual interdependency between individual level and household level attribute. So to do that, what we did here is we used the Kramer's B indicator, which basically represents the association between two variables. And we generated the Kramer's B stat for both pump data, which is the left hand side and, and the synthetic pool, which is the right hand side. And if you do a visual inspection of these two, two three-dimensional plots, you will, we will see that in majority of the cases, the association in the synthetic pool that we found is very similar to the association that is found in the pound data. So that further, in further indicates that the relationship that we are trying to address through the Bayesian network technique is, is representative of the actual population. So now once we have done, so once we have, we are satisfied with, well, we were satisfied with the generation of the synthetic population, then what we did is we distributed the population into different dissemination areas for the Okanagan, central Okanagan region and matched the total number of population as well as the demographic characteristics. And now I will show you the validation related to that. So this is a very regional level validation. So overall in the central Okanagan, how we are doing, as you can see at the household level, and this slide only looks into household level validation. As you can see in, in the real data, we have around 91,690 households. In the synthetic data, we have around 91,745 households. A difference of very little, but 0.06% is what we found. And we again plotted the toiling type of the Bayesian network and the generalized raking in this case, because that's the fitting technique we use to the marginal total. And as you can see, for majority of the categories of the different variables, we are within a range of minus one plus one percent. This is a validation for individual level information. As you, and you can see, as you can see here, we have found a difference of in the, at the individual level, we have found a difference of only 0 0.22 percent. And in, again, in a majority of the cases, the difference is within a range of minus one to plus one percent for most of the categories. Once we have done validation at the regional level, now we wanted to validate at the dissemination area level. So here is an example validation for you. So I, I, here I am validating two attributes. One is an individual level attribute, which is based on gender, which is shown in 
figure A. And the second one is a dwelling type attribute, which is a housing level attribute, which is shown in figure B. And quickly, the, what the resin re legend represents is the darker green, the darker the green is, the less error we have and more red it is, the more error we have. The indicator that we are using in this case is an absolute percent error. And if we take a visual inspection, we will see that, for example, majority of the dissemination areas falls within the darker green. Statistically, around seven, for the age, around 74% of the dissemination areas showed an error percentage within a range of 0 to 0.45% for different gender categories, which is very well. Only 2% of the dissemination areas showed a difference of greater than 10%. And as you can see, these are the areas which are often large and has very little population within them. And the last slide, one of the last slides that we have is another visual inspection. This is of how well we are representing the actual population. So here is the density plot, what we did. The left two figures represents the density of the individual. So each dot represents 25 people. The right two figure represents the density at the household. Each dot represents 10 households. And among the left two, the green one is, or among the four, the green ones are the actual and the blue ones are the synthetic population. So as we can see from the visual inspection, the density is we are finding in the pop synthetic population is very similar to the density that we found in the actual census data. Not only that, some specific observation can also be made. This area, as you can see, is the Clona area. And the majority of the population in the synthetic population lives in this Clona area, which is also evident in the actual bound data, actual census data. Another, another more specific interpretation we can do is we are predicting higher density in areas where there is an urban core, and which is also, again, evident if you see higher density in the urban core areas. So again, these are some of the demonstration that how our synthetic population is representing the actual population. In conclusion, if I summarize what we did is we adopted a Bayesian network technique to expand or to generate a synthetic population and then generalize rating technique to generate, to feed those population and finally generate a 100% synthetic population for the central localizer region of British Columbia. We have demonstrated that capturing heterogeneity within the BN structure has tremendously benefited us to match the actual population. We have also showed that the, within the BM structure, the underlying interrelationship among individual level attributes and household level attributes, we were able to cross validation. We were able to show that, that if there is any interrelationship existing in the existing data, we were able to replicate that in the real data, in the synthetic data, which has also benefited us to have, to create a synthetic population that is very close to the actual. In terms of future works, from the synthetic population perspective, I think one of the future works should be, in our case, yes, we have captured heterogeneity, but we have categorized these different household types very deterministically. I think we should investigate how we can create this, those groups using a more probabilistic method. So that is one thing we should investigate to improve the accuracy. The second future work related to this population synthesis would be, we assumed that the same PN structure applies to each, all households falling under the same household type or group, which might not be true. So for example, among a couple household with children, the structure for a couple household with one children could be significantly different than a couple household with two or three children. So that is something we need to investigate. And finally, which we are doing right now is we are using this synthetic population across to generate the baseline population for the agent based installers model that I showed you initially and do the simulation. This is a published work, which is, has been published in a transcription research record. A link to this paper is below. I would like to thank my funding partners, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Councils of Canada, NSERC. Discovery event and also the CFI job funding for providing all the infrastructure that we I have in my lab. And last but not the least, I would like to thank my amazing graduate students, specifically Nobinu, who is a PhD student, and this is part of his PhD work. One of the one of the chapters will be coming out of this and amazing work he did during for to generate this synthetic population. And finally, thank you everyone. And if you have any questions, happy to answer. 
Thank you, Mama.